Hi, my name is Diane Vance, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the experiment separation of a mixture. You've learned in lecture that mixtures are one of the important classes of matter, along with elements and compounds. Mixtures are very commonly found on the face of the earth. Uh, Seawater would be a very common example of a mixture. Mixtures consist of two or more materials that are not chemically joined. They are simply physically in the same place at the same time. Therefore, you can separate a mixture by using only physical properties. You don't need to run a chemical reaction on it. You've learned in class that examples of some physical properties would be color, taste, odor, density, solubility, and magnetic susceptibility. You saw at the beginning of this film that I've separated a mixture of sand and iron filings by using a magnet. And of course, the iron filings are attracted to the magnet. You could use color to separate a mixture of salt and pepper. If I gave you a fine enough pair of tweezers, it would be tedious to do, but it could be done. In the background, you can see a mixture of oil and water. The water on the bottom is colored blue, the oil on the top colored yellow, and it would be easy to separate the oil and the water mixture based on their relative densities. The property that you're going to use today to separate a mixture is the property of solubility. That is, how much does a material dissolve in water? The mixture that you're going to be working with is going to be a mixture of salt and sand. And you know, of course, that if you put that mixture into water, the salt will dissolve, the sand will not dissolve. This will provide us with a way to separate these two things, and then we will calculate the percent of salt and sand in the mixture. I next want to show you something about the equipment that we're going to use today. Some of it is new to you. Some of it you have used before. You will have a ring stand. Attached to that will be an iron ring. And on the iron ring will be a wire gauze with asbestos in the center that you'll use for heating. You also will have an evaporating dish, a beaker, a watch glass, which will be used to cover the evaporating dish. And you'll need a small stirring rod. Now, the stirring rods, you will probably find more than one length of stirring rod in your desk. You want to be sure to use the small stirring rod, and you'll see why shortly. The main piece of equipment that we're going to use today that is new to you is going to be the Bunsen burner. So before we begin, I want to take a few minutes to show you something about the operation of the Bunsen burner. Uh, first of all, this is a burner. You see it's connected by a rubber hose to the gas jet, which is located on your table. The parts of the Bunsen burner, this part is called the barrel. The barrel can be screwed up and down on the base of the Bunsen burner. This part of the burner is the base. If you turn the burner upside down, you'll see a knob here. This is the gas flow control knob. And this is the knob that you're going to use to actually control the gas flow. In lighting the Bunsen burner, you first of all want to turn the gas jet completely off or completely on. This is not used to regulate the flow of gas. We'll see that the gas flow knob is used to do that. So before you begin to turn the burner on, you want to make sure that this knob is rotated so that it is completely shut, so that it has, is as far up near the barrel as it can be. You also want to be sure that the barrel itself is screwed down as far as it can go. You then would turn the gas jet completely on. When it's completely on, the handle of the jet will be parallel to the hose that's going to the burner. In order to actually light the burner, you would strike a match. And you allow gas to flow by opening up the gas control knob at the bottom. Now, you can see here that you have what's called a luminous flame. It's quite yellow because we don't have any air coming into the flame yet. You want to use this gas control knob to adjust the height of the flame. You see that I can make the flame very large or smaller. And you want to make the flame probably three inches high. After you have gotten the flame approximately to the right height, then you open the air intake by unscrewing the barrel of the burner. And you see that as I do that, the yellow color disappears because we're now admitting air to the flame, and the flame is much hotter than it was before. And it's probably actually fairly hard to see on the tape, but there are two cones, a very pale blue flame, 
And this means you've got a hot flame and you will want to use the upper part of the inner blue cone for heating. When you get ready to turn off the Bunsen burner, you simply can turn it off at the jet. Then you close the barrel and you close the gas flow knob on the bottom and then the burner is ready for the next person to use. The procedure itself is what we're going to talk about next for separation of a mixture. When you came into lab today, you were given an unknown number. Now that unknown will be in the hood when you uh, actually do this lab, but today I have the unknown here at the table with me. There will be unknowns with uh, letters on them, and you make sure to write down the letter of your unknown. The first thing that you need to do is weigh the beaker. And you have used a balance before, so we don't need to review balance use extensively. The balance, of course, should be on. You'll see a digital display on the balance. If you push the zero button, you want to get a display that shows four zeros, 0, 0.000 grams. You then can place the beaker on the balance and be sure that you record the mass of the beaker and you record three decimal places. You want to perform the same operation with the watch glass, the evaporating dish, and the small stirring rod. You don't need to weigh these separately. You simply need to zero the balance again, place these items on the balance, and record the mass of all three on your lab report. After you've finished weighing the beaker and the evaporating dish assembly, you should go to the hood in the room and get your unknown. You've already been assigned an unknown number and it's written on your lab report. Make sure when you go back to get your unknown that you pick up the correct letter of the unknown. This, for example, is unknown E. In the unknown bottle, there will be a scoop. All you need to do is get one scoop of the unknown mixture and transfer it to the beaker. Make sure that you put the scoop back in the same bottle that you got it out of so that we don't contaminate the other mixtures. You then want to take the beaker back to your desk and you want to weigh the beaker again after you have zeroed the balance. And then you will record this in your lab report as the weight of the beaker plus the unknown mixture. That unknown mixture is salt and sand. And we said we were going to separate these two things using solubility. So the next thing we want to do is add some water to this mixture. You'll have a distilled water bottle. You can squeeze about five milliliters into this graduated cylinder and add that five milliliters to the salt and sand mixture. You will then use the stirring rod that you weighed with the assembly and stir this mixture very well. The lab manual says to stir it for about five minutes. Now I'm not going to stir it that long since I'm simply demonstrating the technique. So let's suppose that I have now stirred it for the 10 minute time period. Notice that I'm putting the stirring rod back into the evaporating dish. Don't put the stirring rod down on the table. When you finish this, you will see that the uh, sand settles to the bottom. You now want to perform an operation known as decanting the liquid. And all that means is that you attempt to pour off the liquid material without getting any of the solid material in there. So the liquid will be decanted into the evaporating dish. And you want to be careful not to transfer any of the sand into the evaporating dish. Now this process will be repeated two more times with two more five milliliter quantities of water. So you would simply again fill your graduated cylinder to the five milliliter mark, add the water, stir for five minutes, and then again decant the liquid. By the time you finish this operation, you'll have about 15 milliliters of water in the evaporating dish and that water will contain the salt. Now what we want to do is to get the mass of the salt. So what we have to do is remove the water. And the simplest way to do that is to heat and simply evaporate the water. So you will put the evaporating dish 
on the wire gauze on the ring stand and light the burner in the way that we described earlier. You see again I have a luminous flame. I'm going to make it a little bit shorter because we don't want to heat this too rapidly. And I'm going to open the barrel, get some air in, and we now have a nice hot flame. Now when we heat this, at first there will be enough water here that if you heat it gently uh, it will not splatter. But as the heating goes on and the volume of water is reduced, you're going to tend to get more and more splatter. So after most of the water has evaporated, you want to use the watch glass and put it on top of this so that it prevents the loss of salt from the, the uh, solution. After probably about 10 minutes of heating, all of the water will have been evaporated. When you get to the end of the heating phase, you should see that there's no water left in the evaporating dish and there should be no more splattering of the material. The watch glass underside should also be dry. And that underside should remain dry even after the watch glass cools. If it doesn't, then you haven't heated enough. Now that the heating process is finished and the salt is completely dried, you can turn off the Bunsen burner. You then want to transfer the evaporating dish to the hot pad to cool. Of course, the evaporating dish is going to be hot, so try to remember not to grab the evaporating dish with your hands. Instead, you'll have a pair of tongs. And you can grab the evaporating dish with a pair of tongs and put it down on the hot pad that will be at your table. Now, you don't want to weigh this yet. You always want to weigh a, a, an apparatus or a substance when it's at room temperature. So you have to let that cool before you do the final weight. While you're waiting for that to cool, you still have the beaker with the sand in it. Now, when you decanted the liquid, no doubt you didn't decant every single drop of water that was in there. So you'll, you can look in there and see that the sand is, in fact, wet. So the sand also needs to be dried, because if you weighed this, the weight of the water would contribute a significant amount to the uh, sand's weight. So you, again, just put this on the evaporating dish. You light the burner. And you need to heat this one rather gently. You haven't got very much water here. And if you heat it too hot, the beaker could break, and you will get a lot of splattering of the sand. Again, after you have heated the sand and let it dry, the beaker will be hot. So you can use the tongs to remove the beaker from the wire gauze, put it on the hot pad. And you also need to let it cool off before you weigh it. When the materials have cooled off, you will take each one of them and zero the balance, put them on the balance, and again, weigh them to three decimal places and make sure that you record that weight on your lab report. You will weigh both the evaporating dish and the salt, and you will weigh the beaker with the sand in it. Make sure that the watch glass and the stirring rod are in the evaporating dish when you weigh them, because when you weighed this the first time, you had those two objects as part of the evaporating dish. You now have collected all the data that you need to do the calculations for the experiment. So that I don't confuse you with terminology, you probably remember from lecture that mass and weight really are not the same thing. Mass is the amount of matter in a body, and weight is gravitational attraction. However, in everyday use, we very often use the two terms interchangeably. So whether I say mass or weight, I mean the same thing, that we determine the mass of it on the balance. I'm going to illustrate the calculation for this experiment by using the sand as the example. Here, for example, you can see the mass of the beaker plus the unknown mixture is 35.487 grams. The mass of the beaker alone, 32.532 grams. If we subtract those two, we'll obtain the mass of the mixture by itself, and that's 2.955 grams. We then performed our separation. After separation, we reweighed the beaker. The beaker plus the dry sand had a mass of 33.602 grams. We subtract from that the mass of the beaker, and we get a mass of sand of 1.070 grams. To find the percent of sand, we simply take the mass of sand, 1.070, divided by 
divided by the mass of the mixture, 2.955, multiplied by 100, and the percent of sand is 36.21%. You would then perform a similar calculation for the salt, but you would use the mass of the evaporating dish assembly uh, to calculate the weight of the salt and then divide that by the weight of the mixture. Now that you've finished the experiment, it's time, of course, to clean up. You would, as usual, put all the materials away in the space where they belong. The particular thing I want to note to you about this experiment, though, is the disposal of the chemicals. The salt water, you can just put down the drain, and the salt can be washed down the drain, too. But don't put sand down the drain. You wouldn't want sand in your drains at home, and we don't want sand in the laboratory sinks here. So make sure that you dispose of the sand in the container that's provided for it.